Welcome to the Assistant Lab podcast, hosted by Victoria Ratton and Arnel Martin. This podcast is dedicated to the executive assistant profession, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We've created this podcast for the outliers, the linchpins, the assistants who are serious about their careers. This is a podcast for those who are preparing for the future today. This is a space for no-nonsense content, benchmarking and tracking industry and world trends, as well as interesting interviews with exceptionally inspirational people. The goal here is to stimulate new ways of thinking and being in this profession. So, on with the show. Welcome to this next episode of the Assistant Lab. Wow, are you in for a real treat for the next hour. We are back in Scotland again. And we're speaking to the incredible Julie Burns, who is head of the Vice Chancellor's Office um, at Glasgow Caledonian University. And, and much like public um, and third sector peers, we, we don't hear an, a huge amount um, from peers working in our education sector either. Um, listen, this is this is an hour that is totally worth your time. Very inspiring and enjoy. Julian, welcome to the Assistant Lab. It's really amazing to have you um, on being interviewed by us today. Thank you so much for giving up your time. Good morning, Vic and Anil. It's really lovely to be asked and thank you for having me. And another Scottish accent. It's brilliant. After Rosemary's interview, <laughs> we're still in Scotland. And I, I have to say I have a, a, an extreme preference for the Scottish accent. It's one of the most beautiful accents, in my opinion. So uh, very, very nice to have you on this morning, Julie, and really excited to get into this interview. Um, you're currently with Glasgow Caledonia University. I wanted to find out what's it like being business support in a university environment? Yeah, thank you, Anel. Well, it's, it's very different to anywhere else that I've ever worked. Um, I came to Glasgow Caledonian University in 2012 after mm -hmm. having spent 12 years in the NHS. Mm -hmm. it's a, it was a complete change in culture for me. A lot of the bureaucracy was the same. However, there's much less cash around in the NHS for development, particularly for administrative staff. Mm -hmm. Whereas when I came here, you're actively encouraged to look for development opportunities to you know, there's a there's allocated budgets for the professional services teams, not just academic staff. So it's it's a very different mindset, and you would quite rightly expect that in a, in a university mm. environment. Now, our vice chancellor, which is is the equivalent to a CEO in another mm. organisation, is a, a very good champion of women's development. So for me, ha working closely with her has been transformational. Um, I came into to the university without a first degree. I left mm -hmm. school at 16, uh, didn't feel that having a degree was top of my agenda. Mm. However, um, I only ever did a kind of basic HR certificate way back with another employer, uh, but I was able to kind of use those credits plus my on the job lots of years experience mm -hmm. to be able to do a master's degree in human resource management which doesn't also you know it, it helps me within my job as leader of, of the wider team as well and um, so it does that was that was a huge factor for me and being able to graduate in 2016 with our other students was was amazing so working in the business support in this sector is very rewarding we have a mission for the common good, which a high percentage of both our staff and students really buy into. 25% mm -hmm. um, of our students are from the most disadvantaged areas in the city, but we've got retention rates of, of, of 90, 93 percent. So incredible. being able to, yeah, being able to play a part in a young person's journey mm -hmm. is, is quite is quite heartwarming, you know, being part of the, their family's joy. Mm. Oh God, I'm filling up. <laughs> You're going to have to edit that. And rightly right. so. And rightly so. Can I yeah. tell you something? I think the satisfaction of that legacy component, we are not just pushing paper. We are not just producing things for sale. We are changing people's lives. Yeah. That is meaningful. And like I said to you, I think the legacy component of looking back and saying, I support my team so we can do this together, yeah. which 
I mean, that that's really, really heartwarming. And I think, you know, having worked on the SIPA bursary on, on our end, fundraising for students from disadvantaged backgrounds to get an education, I think that really resonates with me. And, you know, not having kids myself, it was always important for me, what is your legacy? What do you leave behind? So, you know, I think that's, that's an incredible um, way of looking at what you do. And the fact that they respect your development needs mm -hmm. and support those development needs and the fact that you work for an inspirational female leader, you know, that's also inspiring in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the business support obviously covers the same areas, as you would imagine, in other in other sectors. We, we've got a team of 10. Um, we look after the senior leadership team. We manage a wide range of committees and meetings. However, we're also actively encouraged in our own right to be represented on specific groups. So we have not, uh, we have representatives of our team who sit on the graduation group, the equality and diversity group, health and safety, data protection, um, International Women's Day, you know, just to, na to mm. name a few. And we're obviously as a team heavily involved in our twice a year graduation ceremony. Mm. So nice to have them back face to face, uh, which Absolutely. has been amazing. So we manage the platform party on the stage. Um, it takes place at our, the Glasgow Royal Concert Hall, which is just opposite our, our university campus. So um, we've got, the, my team have the, the logistics down to a T. You know, they work with all the other stakeholders around the, around the event. We deal with the, the honorary graduates and the VIP guests. So it's quite, it's a privileged position to be in. Uh, this year we had Julia Gillard, who was the former Prime Minister of yeah. Australia, and um, she's well known for her misogyny speech. I'm not sure if anyone's not had a chance to, to have a look at that on YouTube. It is utterly amazing. So it's de definitely worth a watch. And yeah, you know, we juggle all the usual tasks while, while making the working with the leadership team to support their strategic objectives, juggling a million plates, drafting speeches. It's just, it's just no two days are ever the same. And being able to grow my leadership to role as well, you know, we've got our team of 10 are across university. We've just recruited, soon to become team of 11, um, recruited to another post at our Glasgow campus, which will work closely with our team. So yeah, it's very, it's very interesting and working for our, for our, current vice chancellor is 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 hugely rewarding and uh, yeah she's departing us at the end of the year so we have our, our new vc joining us in january and we're, we're transitioning in and out which is which is good so yes yeah, uh, i hope that gives you a wee bit of a flavor yeah absolutely and it does sound like you have quite an empowered team on your end and i do think that when you are in an organization that empowers their business support professionals, your outcomes, your results are just so much better. Yeah, exactly. We've, I think the last time we counted up, we have something like 160 years experience between us all. Wow. Um, some of the team have been here for, for some over 30 years, which I think is amazing. It just mm. speaks volumes for how how the university has has looked after you know looked after their staff and and is seen as a as a good place to work. That's so, incredible. Yeah. And I think G, GCU is a bit of a pen up because I'm not going to name this university because I'll probably get a lawyer's letter. But there is one in this country and probably more that refuse to give their PAs any yeah. budget for training. I mean, literally nothing. And as Julie's pointed out, you kind of would expect that. I mean, this is part of the education sector. If they not yeah. get it right, then frankly how can private businesses third sector um but it's, i think um gcu is a bit of a pin-up kind of employer in the in the pa industry um really it's a it's such a good case study isn't yeah. it really um, we were to win rosemary's um employer of the year award at rosemary mm, that's PA incredible award. that was 2018 so yeah, yeah it's good to get that recognition as well and how do you juggle kind of doing what we call the day-to-day -day job with uh, people management as well? Because we've actually been speak talking quite a lot in the episodes we've done so far, actually, about people management and how it's become an increasing kind of part of some people's roles. How do you juggle it all? Because it's a lot, isn't it? 
Yeah, so we, we tend to try and keep the direct reports fairly small. So within our team, I have three direct reports and two of those are line managers of three and four of the other mm. teams. Yeah. yeah. So that's it. So we've got a bit of a structure as well for yeah. success planning through although you know a lot of us tend to stay stay around for a long time so <laughs> um but yeah so so we try and not have you know it wouldn't be sustainable for me to exact for example to line manage all 11 yeah. other members of the team so we try and, and split it up but the three of us have a leadership team as well just to mm -hmm. uh just to empower the others to, to to work with their own team and you know they're all responsible adults that manage their own workload we're not we're not clock watchers we, just, we don't have that type of mm. environment everyone it's give and take and mm. during covid it was it was quite it was challenging not being with physically with people mm. but we kept you know we kept in touch as, as every organization did we just adapted and um, we had some we had a bit of a tricky situation that one of our team members sadly passed away during COVID, um, which was probably in my leadership role so far was the worst mm. situation of having to deal with that and having to tell people that part in part that news over that this this model of, of delivery mm. was was not ideal um, mm. and just not being able to come together to, yeah. to comfort each other. Yeah, yeah. So we yeah. had we did have we have a little garden area. Um, mm -hmm. We're on the second floor of a building, we've got a little balcony, so we've got a nice little bench now and some flowers mm -hmm. that, of, that of her favourite colour and things like that. So it's, it was nice to go there and just be together on her anniversary, you know. It's, yeah. So yeah, that was pretty tough. Mm. Yeah, I think it would have been for a lot of people. And when you're dealing with bereavement, it's you need that kind of human touch, don't you? And that's, yeah. like you said, having to do it via these mediums, it would have made it all the more challenging yeah um, but you're, you've Absolutely. still come out of it such a strong team as well haven't you and mm. and stuck together and I think that is um a kind of testament to GCU that so many of you have been there so long yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> did you celebrate your 10 years so it's 10 years you've been there this yeah, year 10 years, yeah mm -hmm. I know. Wow. Do they celebrate long service at GC? Yeah, so we celebrate 10 years and 25 years where yeah. you get additional holidays for that year and, and, a, and a, a, a small gift, small gift, small monetary gift for 10 years, a bit more substantial for 25 yeah. years. And then we had we had one of our ladies was 30 years just just a, a few weeks ago. So we were able to kind of you know, acknowledge that as a team and mm -hmm. congratulate. Well, that's incredible. Yeah. And, you know, I think when you have that long tenure in a position and the team stays the same, you have a level of stability that few other companies or organizations can emulate. Mm -hmm. We know we have to be good to each other. We know we have to support each other because nobody's going anywhere. So it becomes almost like a family and you have that built in support and you get to know each other so well. Most marriages don't last 10 years. <laughs> You know, let, let's be serious now so having those long-term colleagues I think can add so much value in the long term and the fact that you are all encouraged to keep developing you have those budgets you have that team dynamic where you are empowered and you are giving them the opportunity to step up into management positions themselves you know I think that's so good for cohesion and to keep things fresh but you have that stability of the long tenure. Yeah, yeah. I think it's probably quite unique. I, I think, think so. it is. I yeah, so. and I and it's not something that's going to happen much in the future because of mm. well, we've been to, and well, I know we're going to talk to you about this as well. But the fact that people are not going to stay in the same profession mm. for forty years now, they're not even going to probably give a company more than a couple of years before they're moving on. It's just mm. the evolving kind of work landscape yeah um and it's interesting um but part of it is a little bit sad in a way as well because mm. you know I've got kind of lifelong friends from some of the you know companies I've worked at for a number right. of years and shared life's trials and tribulations with them and um yeah it'll be it'd just be interesting to see how it pans out mm. but Julie frankly you don't look old enough but you did start your career as an office junior back in 1988 um, what made you get into all of this in the first place? Yeah, well, you know, I'm showing my age now, Vic, but thank <laughs> you. <don't> you. <laughs> <laughs> 
when I was in secondary school and in, in Scotland, you're, you have to choose your main subjects for your qualifications mm -hmm. and, you know, sort of what we call second year um, in, in Scotland. So I was always interested in typing and and sec it was called secretarial studies in those days. So mm. um, I, I, I'm generally an organised person mm. at home as well. So I just thought, you know, university was never particularly an option. I didn't, I wasn't huge. I didn't get huge, amazing academic results in, in, my, in my secondary school. So I thought, well, let's focus on my strengths of organising and, you know, just being able to to be that kind of secretary type, which is what was very much called back in those days. Um, and I just loved those classes. We we learned to type on an old fashioned typewriter with the keys blanked out, you know, yeah. and, the, and the the QWERTY keyboard up at the front of the classroom. So you had to, do, you literally had to, to learn that way. I just couldn't wait for the next week for the class to come again. So um, yeah, they were, they were my absolute favorite. And back, back in those days, there was that stereotypical role of the secretary mm. painting her nails, um, et cetera, you know, but we've come on leaps and bounds since absolutely. then. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So I just really um, like the idea of being an, being an office professional. Yeah. Um, and being key to either the, the, the leader of the organ, you know, a team or or the leader of an organisation, however big or small. And I've worked and been fortunate to work in both big and small places. So, yeah, it offers uh, so many opportunities for people, mm. you know. And, you know, I think you touched on a very important point. You said in your personality, the way you are wired was instrumental in the decision. And I often find when I talk to delegates or, you know, other people who come from the profession, they will say to me, you know, this is my personality. The job fits who I am as a person. I'm a caring individual. I'm organized. I like to look after people. It all slots in beautifully. And the one day I was speaking to a lady and she said, I would have become a nurse, but I really don't like blood. <laughs> you know, this this to me was a much better option. I can still care for people, look after them, make sure that they're comfortable, but I don't have to, to work with anything gross. Mm -hmm. So, and I actually thought to myself, there is those service industries, those care industries. I think there's a lot of that in your personality before you make the decision. That's why it's such an attractive job. Yeah, absolutely. But it also offers so, so much, many opportunities and lots mm -hmm. of different it's sort of strands that you can bra branch out you know for some it, it's maybe a stepping stone to a management role or a sideways step into project management or governance or mm -hmm. events planning you know and and of Absolutely. course senior you know the amount of people that we know who are senior managers that started in mm -hmm. in PA and business support roles so yeah you learn you know small p politics emotional yeah. intelligence Business and you're getting acumen. you're getting management training for free. Yeah, you're in the you're in the front row watching the show. I always say to people who are considering the the EA profession as a stepping stone, that is valid. Remember that you don't take it for granted. Don't treat it as less than. Use it as a learning opportunity, because irrespective of our position in the organisation, we've got proximity. And that is very valuable. And we have access to a lot of uh, documents that most people don't see. If you are using that to improve your business acumen, you really are moving yourself forward in leaps and bounds. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things I know we're going to come on to that later about, you know, selling this role to future mm. future workforce. It's about what you, you make it. Now, yeah. I, I could have quite easily sat in one of my early roles and just sat there for 10, 20 years. However, mm -hmm. you, you can make it and stretch it in, in as much and in whichever way you you want. There may be some organizations who don't allow that. And then yeah. if that's what you want, you move, you know, it's, yeah. it's you find hour. a place it's where bus. it's valued. Yeah. Move off, the, you know, jump off that bus and get on another bus. Mm -hmm. So I, we, you know, as a profession, we are facing multiple challenges. What would you say from your own opinion are some of the challenges that are being faced, whether it's your, Scotland, UK in general, or worldwide? Yeah, I think definitely, Anel, is the economic state of the world as we come through the pandemic and the, the 
impending mm. recession, the, the cost of living. It's just there's so many factors just now. Mm. And if, it's hard to obviously try and remain upbeat in, mm. in that in that arena. And I also think that a lot of the support roles are basically the first roles to go when companies have to downsize. And, you know, they then realize it's not the best decision mm. because when they start financially coming, you know, a bit becoming a bit more stable, these are the first roles to be recruited to as well. Correct. Yes. Correct. We've they never learn the lesson, though. I know. They never learn. No. They <laughs> <laughs> and they do this globally. It's not just something that happens in the UK. It happens here as well. And I think often, I mean, in South Africa, we've got very, very stringent labor laws. So it's not easy to fire somebody through the process. So often they use these retrenchments to get rid of those personalities or those, those people in the group who aren't pulling their weight. So you know, often we have this, they, they will come in and say, we're cutting the headcount by 50%. You all now need to apply for your own jobs. And, you know, that, that kind of exercise, I've, I've seen it. I keep saying, you know, now you're getting an executive to type his own reports. What it costs me as an assistant versus a top management person typing with one finger. How does that even make sense? What you are paying per hour for that person to do it that person to do their own travel arrangements, that kind of thing, that um, short-term win on the retrenchments, but the long-term waste of, of talent and man hours just never makes any sense to me. Yeah, yeah. So that I think that's the main issue, and I think that can mm -hmm. affect a lot of motivation across across the profession. The, the other thing I think is big, big and, and ties in is that because companies are downsizing, and we, we are fortunate here at the moment, we've we've managed to recruit as, as quite a number of other universities, a, a good international cohort. So we're very, really financially stable at the minute. So we don't have uh, any sort of any of this hanging on our, on our shoulder. Um, so that's, so, and we do appreciate that we're, you know, that's, yeah. we're fortunate. But I also think that there are sectors where when they are downsizing, they're maybe leaving one or two of our profession in, in, in roles but then as a result they're having to take on more mm -hmm. they're being you know potentially looked at everything being dumped on their, yeah. on their desk. Yeah. yeah and that could be it could be it could work two ways it could be that yes well we're victims of our own success mm -hmm. we know they know we can do the job and get it done mm -hmm. properly but it, it could you know it could just be that the EAs are seen to have that capacity and yeah. I think it's you know just that perception that oh they'll be able to do that she'll she, he or she can do that and take that mm. on when, and I, I think you make such a valid point there mm. the question of how the perception from people is about our capacity yes. so I always said my husband's in the audiovisual so he's in the technical space he always makes things look as difficult as humanly possible, okay? And then he wants a standing ovation. In my role, <laughs> I have... Did you listen to... to this podcast, by the way, Anel? <laughs> um, well, I hope not this one. Um, but my, we always have the discussion where I've got to take something very complex, very intensive, and make it look easy. And I think we sell it like that. We keep pulling the rabbits out of the hat. Eventually, the rabbits just get keep getting bigger and more ridiculous um so i think there is that perception of because we are pulling those rabbits out of the hat they just say here are more rabbits go wild um like you said um you've done such a good job congratulations here's more work that's the reward mm -hmm. so i think that is a very valid point that you make yeah and i so that in itself can lead to burnout you know mm -hmm. lack of motivation i think that's probably a, a big thing in the sector at the moment just mm -hmm. based on some of the social media articles that we're reading mm -hmm. um so that was probably the two main things in l yeah do you think if you look at this that there's a lack of confidence and a lack of assertiveness that feeds into this overwhelm, this overwork, um, this lack of motivation. You kind of feel like I can't fight back. I can't push back. I can't question the status quo. Do you think that that, that features into it? I think it does. I think you're absolutely right. And I think if you don't have the 
the most supportive relationship with your executive, then that is that is just amplified 10 times worth. However, I think at 16, I certainly wouldn't have discussed any of that with, with my um, the director that I worked with at that time, but because of my age and lack of experience. However, now I have a voice, I have a seat at the table and I'm going to use it. Yeah. quite frankly and and you know if if that if you don't feel like that you can't have the support from your executive that there, there's no there's there's no working relationship there mm. and you know if, if you're not you, you made a very good point if you're not valued if you're not empowered where you are and you are top performer keep doing your work on that top level you will find a way into the right organization that will value it. I, I often have these conversations where people say, I wish I could speak up. I wish I could voice my ideas. And I say to them, just keep doing you. Somebody will spot the potential and you will move on organically or you will set yourself up for the next position, but don't fall into the culture you're in. You know, mm -hmm. um, Then you will stay where you are. So I think you make an, an absolutely excellent point there. I, I do think PAs and picking up a bit on what you suggest I think PAs in the UK probably in the western world <laughs> more generally but I think since that 2008 recession it, it does feel like we have been beaten down as a, a profession time and time again because I mean even the the you know the dynamics of that recession and it went on for 10 years you know predominantly at the start it was the banking and financial sector PAs who were being made redundant then a year later charity PAs it it was quite shocking because a lot of PAs at that point who'd been in the industry for a little while hadn't experienced being made redundant mm -hmm. and so that was a big shock in itself and the fact it went on for so long and then other sectors started feeling it five years in and then there was more redundancies and I mean one of our members I think she got made redundant about four times in a year she'd start a new job at another company and then that would fall down I mean she says that she's like really uber resilient now but mm -hmm. It, it has felt like non-stop since 2008 because obviously we had the then the Brexit uh, debacle as I call it and that stalled our economy for three years yeah. while the, whilst they were trying to thrash that out um, and parts of the UK went into recession again and then we go straight into a pandemic and now we're facing another recession <laughs> and you know we are the as Julie's already pointed out we are the first on the chopping block and we've yeah. talked about this in a previous podcast but when you're giving it from a HR perspective, this this profession is easy pickings mm -hmm. because, and I've said it before, we don't fight back. The business yeah. case for this profession is just not robust enough um, or it doesn't seem to be. And also, Vic, here I also have a thought. If we are not communicating and really showcasing what we do, that is also why it's the first on the chopping block and it's the first to come back because they only realize what went out the door once it's out the door. Mm. So perhaps it's also a call to action to really verbalize and communicate the value that you're adding. Mm. You know, um, especially during COVID, I kept saying to people, when you are working directly with your executive in the office, your executive really has a view of what you're doing, okay? When we are working remotely online, it becomes so much more important to communicate the wins the challenges, you know, to really keep that very robust. And I do think that we we don't make enough of what value we physically add. If I look at some of the LinkedIn profiles that I read, it's kind of, it's fluffy and it's generic. And I think we all need to do a better job in saying, this is what the profession does mm -hmm. beyond, I answer the telephone, I schedule the meetings, you know, that kind of stuff. We all know that that's part of the job, those operational things, are important and form part of the role but we're not communicating what the role has expanded into yeah you're i totally agree with both of you and uh, we have within our leadership we actually have an agenda item called raising our profile ah, so that's like fantastic that, that across, is fantastic across our organization so um, for example you know actually being physically represented on these groups is something that didn't historically happen in the past but we've, we've introduced that interestingly during covid and on the zoom and teams platform it's it's quite strange that you actually feel more 
you actually feel like you have a seat you're on the same mm -hmm. level I don't know if it's psychological but you're on the same level as the as the team because you're mm -hmm. on the screen you're not sitting at the side you're not mm -hmm. sitting at the back typing up furiously you know and and just the way that everyone was more concerned about people's interactions during this time you were encouraged to to so that's probably helped in in that respect but yeah just going back to what you said Vic I think the resilience is you know I think we can all we all think we're hugely resilient but it, that poor member who was made redundant four times in a row I mean that that's a lot to pick yourself yeah. up from confidence wise mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because you start doubting your own abilities yeah. as a PA, is it me? But actually it was the, you know, the economic times, there were completely different um, sectors that she was going into. And they, it, like I said, it was, it's not everybody's affected all at once. I mean, you know, even with the recession we're going into now, small businesses are starting to make a lot of redundancies at the moment, despite the recent announcements by our prime minister um some of the bigger firms te the technology sector has been making quite a few redundancies but they started that back in about march yeah um so it's not you know you could get made redundant say as a pa from a bank and then go and get a pa job in the tech sector and then suddenly you're at risk again but as and we've all said the it's the job yeah it's, it's the, the job of the draw yeah. yeah yeah um it's tough and looking at kind of young people now um, Julie, I mean, we've let's be honest about it and straight up. Young people are just not interested in this profession on the main. They're not. Mm -hmm. I mean, even with the apprenticeship um, scheme, it's all kind of lumped in the admin uh, apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. They're not the most widely taken up. And actually, there's some of that old mentality, which British parents used to use, which was, well, you're not academically bright enough. Go, go and be an admin it's a safe job safe pair of hands for you um and so some of the people that have started admin apprenticeships because I've spoken to some of them have said well mum and dad sort of ushered me into it I said I couldn't sit in my bedroom playing the xbox um it's just not then they're, they're not seeing it's not it's, a sexy job no and and so, I think so again it comes saw. back to how we are positioning it if you really spent a day with me in my office, you would see that this is an incredible job. But why are we not communicating that? It's weird. Any thoughts, Judy? Yeah, we... yeah. I mean, I do wonder if there's something about just getting back into the schools, into that kind of grassroots. Do you know, I do remember, and I'm sure that it's all way more virtually exciting than it than my day. It was, you know, you went around a careers fair with stalls of people selling oh, their yeah. professions. So, you know, is is there something about getting and tar targeting into the youngsters and and the social media elements and as you say in L selling it as a sexy job mm -hmm. as a job that's not these you know stereotypical sitting answering the phone being the old Rottweiler at the door you know yeah. which I have tried desperately hard in my advancing years not to become not to become that you know but in that just being the PA just being the admin yeah I work with I work for we encourage mm -hmm. people to say I work with yeah. not I work for because you work yeah. with you work for the organization but you yeah. work with your it's just just yeah. different types of That's language cool. I mean, I, I did a chat to some young people at the school. This was probably, I think, about six years ago now. And there was definitely some interest, but it was all, well, what about being a celebrity PA? And it was, it was all about the celebrity thing. And I was like, but there's so many other jobs. And I've been the EO to the CEO of a charity and helped change disabled people's lives. And it was like, yeah, um, how do we become a celebrity? <laughs> But do you no, the, think that there's no, also the that of... is the influence of social media itself? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I always say the glorification of the Kardashians, you know, um, the real housewives of wherever. I think there's a component <laughs> of that as well, you know, that, mm -hmm. that we're not positioning them to look at serious. I mean, there was a study a while ago that said like 30% of, of youngsters wanted to be social media influencers or, you know, yeah. I think there's an element of that as well. There is. The celebrity arena is just, it's, you know, you get yourself on a Love Island show oh. and you're apparently made for life with fashion 
um, internships and mega sponsorships when you come out. But the reality is, you know, with, in the west of Scotland, that's highly unlikely <laughs> to happen. And uh, in rural Dorset as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think well, you know, now you tell me Love Island. I was on a, a 4x4 TV show we were filming last week. Now you tell me Love Island. I'm doing this all wrong. <laughs> But I do think there are a couple more things, Vic. I mean, I do mm. think that a professionally recognised career pathway with an organisation, mm. you know, such as the, the CIPD, um, just to, something that EAs can actually see that pathway coming mm. in and, and just selling it to that, to that sort of top level EA stroke, you know, um, people manager or manager of mm. in, in, other, in another area. Um, and the other thing I, I do think, and it's just from personal experience, and I do, I, it's a bit controversial because I don't think you need a degree to become agreed a, a PA. However, the confidence and self belief that I gained mm, when I did mine by doing it yes. was just amazing. Mm. So, and you know, maybe part time postgraduate qualifications with a, with a, with the university or like what Adam Fiddler's doing in his academy. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, you don't it's not for everyone. And yeah. everyone may may have a different time in their life with whatever caring responsibilities when it's just not appropriate. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you get you get to a stage and you think, actually, oh, well, that person thinks I can do this. So mm-hmm. I'm going to give it a shot. And you and we this is an ongoing discussion about do you prefer experience over a qualification? Mm-hmm. And I always say I would absolutely recruit for both. If you've got the option, recruit for both. If you can only have one, I'm going to pick the person with experience every day of the week. Yeah. That is it's a no-brainer. Um, but the the combination, and I keep saying to people, we have to think, especially in South Africa, you know financially the cost of education is yeah. exorbitant yeah. so what I've been saying to people who say to me I know should I be looking at a degree I say you know what if that's where you want to go great if money does not allow bundle short courses yeah. in a in a very structured way go and find high value big ticket items where you dip in and you do short courses and you build your own curriculum that's also an option so I think we need to to look at this differently and just coming back to to youngsters I think we should be positioning this as if you want if you're a future CEO and that's the game plan doing three or four years as an executive assistant is going to set you up for success if you are in the process of moving into project management again this is a phenomenal starting point yeah. because project managers have to work cross-functionally they have to work without positional power most of the time because some people outrank you some people you know you're working with people on all levels so I think there's a great deal of value especially if we you know Vic alluded to it people will go through three or four professions, not three or four careers, Mm -hmm. but saying to them, this is an ideal starting point for certain professions. I Mm -hmm. think that's how we should be looking at it. Absolutely. And I do agree that if you have young, young people coming into your organization just to do that, and there's, they're, they're so honest now, they, they, they're quite happy to, 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 you know, say, well, I'm, I, I, this is not where I want to be. However, I do think this is a grounding. I'm mm. going to learn as much as I can while I'm here. I'm going to mentor all these amazing EAs who have got, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years experience. And and we would also learn from them too. Yeah. It's, it's like mentoring, which yeah. is another amazing experience. You know, I've had uh, various mentors throughout my different different career options, you know, all there for a specific time and for a specific purpose some who are still good friends uh, close friends so yeah the, and what I've learned from both I'm mentoring someone Vic at the minute from IPA so what we're learning from each other is 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 great it's yeah. always two-way learning while we're talking about learning and lessons looking back on your career what do you think the big lessons are if you had to meet your younger self and you had to give her advice from where you are now what would you tell young Julie? Gosh, um, I think the first thing is that <laughs> uh, no, I would know my worth more. 
um, mm. just that not just the PA. Mm. You know, if I'd if I'd fallen into that trap earlier in my career, I would I would about giving my my time back with my ex giving up my time with my exec. Never mm. ever do that. We are mm. as important, if not more important, yeah. than their other direct reports. So you're sending the wrong message straight away. Mm -hmm. So I, I would I would that would be my absolute first point. The second, the second thing is that I would, I would caution myself that the grass is not always greener. So we've all, we've all been there. We've all been enticed by organisations offering bigger and better packages. And, and I was caught out with this a long time ago. I worked two jobs. I, I had a PA role and I had a part-time job in a bar. Mm -hmm. um, and I was desperate to give that up. But, you know, I worked there for 10 hard but enjoyable years made some lifelong friends it was a lovely family run establishment um you know lots of amazing probably not for this podcast stories but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was intrigued at this point by a, a private sector role that came up and it was it was paying the same as as a, as the two jobs and I mm. thought that would be great however it involved quite a lot of travel um mm you know a, a longer commute for me um uh, the process threw me up a couple of red flags which I should have which should have been the warning um not least when I went for the first informal discussion and I traveled 40 miles to get there the executive didn't show up ding ding not a good look, <laughs> not a good look. That, so you know I was so tempted by the grass being greener um, mm. and I did take the, I did I was offered the role I took the role um but I was only there for 10 weeks yeah. so you know it was it's like what you say you can tell by tell by your gut feeling that it wasn't a place I wanted to be um at all however I do think you know life takes you in these twists and turns to get to get to where you are and the next role was was definitely a, a one that I was there for five years it was mm. it was brilliant so for me don't think the grass is always greener and mm. always trust your instinct I mean yeah the red flags were there and I just was so focused on having one job and and you know maintaining that kind of financial sustainability but so from a work perspective that would be my top two tips but from mm -hmm. a personal perspective um don't don't ever I just feel don't give up if you have a vision if you have an ambition to get to a specific organization or support a, a particular type of leader in mm. in whichever set in whichever sector have the confidence to do that mm -hmm. I, I do think if I'd had more confidence when I was younger um it, it may have changed my path but then, then again it may not because you know yeah. serendipity mm -hmm. and all but that you also I, I loved what you said you know every single thing that's happened is part of my story and yeah. got me to where I am mm -hmm. you know I'm always worried about that butterfly effect if we change one thing where will I be now you know so again I think we we learn those important lessons and the fact that you said trust your gut I'm sure if we talk to every single EA on the planet they've had that moment where they should have listened to their gut there was a red flag you know, and the red flags are not always overt. I mean, one of my most spectacular red flags, and I literally pulled out of the interview process, the executive phoned us at 12 o'clock at night to see if we would pick up the phone. And if you wow. didn't pick up the phone, you weren't shortlisted. My and I thought to myself, if that's not a horrific nuclear level red flag, then I don't know what is. Mm -hmm. And the next morning I told the HR person, you know what? I picked up the phone, but please, you know, take me off that list. I don't want this in my life. Mm. But again, you know, when you are younger, you kind of fall into, this is a promotion. This is a step up. This is more money. Again, that, that where you, you have to weigh up what you are sacrificing to have those things and whether it makes sense for your life. Mm, exactly. Definitely. I'm always very surprised though given the intelligence levels of this profession how they a lot of PAs don't spot the red, red flags which are blatantly there at interviews yep some of them are over some of them are a bit under the radar um but just tweaking some of the questions you ask in interview of that you know potential employer could open that 
up and stop you making those mistakes. But Vic, I've been there. You think yeah, to no, yourself, I'm tough. I can do it. Everyone else had a problem. I'm tough. I can do it. Mm, I've yeah. been there. I mean, a, a specific executive that I was assigned to work with, he literally went through something like eight EAs in four years. The one that lasted the shortest left at lunchtime on the same day. Wow. And I'm called in and I think, but I'm different. I can do this. You know, I think there's also that element. It's not that you don't spot it. You mm-hmm. kind of think that you're different and you've done you've done it. You've got the t-shirt. So this is no different. You'll adjust. So I think there's that element as well. Yeah, I also think you're right in what you said there, Vic. It's it's about you taking that opportunity put them in the spotlight yeah. the interview mm. process is a two-way yeah. situation yeah. you know uh, so yeah that's you should be in deciding whether this is a place you want to work for whichever yeah. their yeah. values are uh, absolutely with yourself and it's funny I'll just share a quick story with you one of my CEOs who ex-CEOs who I adore um when I it's quite well known in the city at the time and when it kind of word got around as it does in the sectors in the city that I was going to be his new EA I actually had a couple of messages from London PA saying I cannot believe you're going to work with him do you know that reputation he's got you know the litter of PAs he's had and I'm like yeah I've heard some of it but we did there we clicked an interview and there was some real synergy and he you know he ended up being a fantastic boss for me and I was a good um, EA for him but uh, <laughs> I had other PAs giving me the red flags but yeah. actually they weren't red flags for me um, because I and just I was an acquired taste as a PA that's one of the things I used to say. <laughs> a, a, a bit, same here a bit more might and I do think Vic you make a very important point don't always listen to what the other PAs say mm-hmm. make up your own mind do not always trust the outside voices because the outside voices don't always come in with a pristine agenda, okay? So always look at where you're getting the information and what filter you put it through. Mm. That's exactly right, because it's it's like everything, isn't it? What works for one coupling pairing doesn't, doesn't always yeah. work for the other, so yeah. And it definitely is synergy. It's almost chemistry. You know, if, if you can get along, I always say you have to be incredibly similar or you've got to be opposites that fit together. You know, that's the best matching that I found in my own experience. So you don't have to be the same, although that works really well. I had a a female executive, a lady executive who is, I mean, I think we probably were cut from the same piece of material way back when, you know, I could finish her sentences when she's trying to explain what to do in a presentation. She says, please go and sit with so-and-so. They don't get it. And Mm -hmm. that's all she needs to say. But we were very aligned. But also the extreme opposite seems to work really well. Mm. I will, and something else I will touch upon, you've probably seen it, Julie, as well. I don't know whether this ha- is happening in SA, but there's a lot, and I'm just going to come out and say, there's a lot of sexed up job advert, PA mm. job adverts at the moment. I'm not Yucky. talking about um, the feminization, which is still a bit of an issue, mm. but I'm, you know, these roles that have been embellished to sound very pompous and bigger than they actually are. And, yeah. you know, we've had then had members that have got the job, gone in and realised there isn't really a job there. And they are back to doing sort of those admin type stuff. And there's very, very the low level operational stuff. Yeah, it's terrible. I had a quick look um, a couple of weeks ago um, at one of the job boards. I always like to kind of touch mm. base and check it. And I'm thinking and I could spot it because... Mm of you know my background and experience and I thought this this has just been totally ramped up there is no job here you've somebody in HR has put in a load of snazzy words made it sound magnificent and and I'm, I'm just sitting there thinking at looking at one of them the PA that gets in there um is gonna end up being bored in a couple of months because it's sold it's sold as top level when you get there you are, we were having this discussion it's like when you need if if I'm a scalpel you can't use me to do the job of an axe. That's the best comparison I can do. Mm. For the price, rather get two axes, okay? Mm. Instead of one expensive scalpel, get two axes. So totally, we, we are experiencing it in South Africa, but I think there's a huge disconnect between recruitment professionals, the exec team who's recruiting, and the EA on the other side. You know, And often it's just a question of what are you really looking for? And mm. verbalizing that 
accurately, but I do sometimes feel, you know, specifically in South Africa, that the, the HR professionals and the recruiters working in this space often don't know what they're looking for. They don't know. I mean, and I'm very wary. We, we often have the discussion about if there's no salary scale, you wasting my time and I'm wasting your time. Let's not even have the conversation. So I'm always wary of that. And I wish that that would be something that changes because you go through that incredible process just to find out they can't afford you or, you know, they're completely pitching it at the wrong level. Yeah, I agree. And I do think there is something about having that confidence to make that first step. If there, if there's an advert that catches your eye, then pick up the phone, yeah. phone the person that's in the informal discussion person that's on mm -hmm. the advert, tell them what you're worth and tell them mm -hmm. what you're, you know, don't, as you say, Anel, don't waste each another's time. Yeah, definitely. There's definitely. And Judy, actually thinking about your career and now we're into a bit of a recruitment thing. You've got a fantastic background and you have come through private sector. You've done NHS. You know, you're now in the education sector. A lot of PAs are told by recruiters that they cannot transition to another sector and then it, uh, this happens a lot in the UK and our recruiters say it all the time. No, you can't go into banking because you haven't got banking experience, but you've done it. You've mm -hmm. transitioned. What Any kind of tips for PAs who have been told that at the moment that they can't go and work in another sector because they don't have experience of it? Yeah, well, one thing for me, A, if somebody tells me I'm not going to do it, I'm blooming hell going to try. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so don't tell me I can't do it. Yeah. And we're lucky in this profession. What we have is hugely transferable skills, mm. transferable across so many different arenas and sectors. If you have the business acumen, the emotional intelligence, nobody comes in and asks you to do a typing test these days. You know, it's more about skills, competency-based interview questions and <laughs> assessments. But, you know, yeah don't don't tell me I'm not going to be able to do it because I can and and actually where is your evidence base to suggest that mm. who said that may just be one example and if that was the advice I would get I was be getting from a recruiter then I'm sorry I wouldn't be I wouldn't be using that that no, recruiter and it's strange that you mention this Vic because this is not the same in South Africa look obviously if you've got corporate experience with one of the big five companies mm -hmm. in South Africa, that makes you infinitely more marketable. But we always say, you know, in South Africa, we've got massive unemployment. There's a lot of competition for jobs. So you can't be fussy, but we always say the assistant role is such a safe role because even if, you know, you, you have one industry fall to pieces, we can hop into another industry. As an engineer, if you're working, let's say, for example, in the telecom space, and there's a huge hiccup, you're an engineer in telecoms. You, that engineering, you can only take into so many spheres off that. But as an EA, and especially as an EA who does the job the way it should be done, you pay attention, you've got good business acumen, you settle in fast. It's, it, there's no difference between sectors and between new teams. It's the same onboarding process. You know, you learn th things in the same way. So it's, it's very strange for me that that would be a UK thing. Mm. And kind of, um, I know we're coming to the end now. I could sit, sit here and talk to Julie all day. Um, but And I know we've mentioned it quite a lot to EPA over the years, and Anel's talked about it in her presentations, but the perception thing is still out of whack. And... It's gone downhill in the last few years, I, I think, from certainly when I'm dealing with employers and HR departments. Um, and some of it is our kind of industry's own fault, this whole positioning of Mary Poppins and superheroes and all the candy floss and pink fluff. Um, I'll give you an, an example of this. Um, the, there's a company um, and the boss told me, and this was pre-COVID, that they stopped their PAs from going to our national trade show because um, he said they weren't, they didn't seem to be learning an awful lot, but they were coming back with goodie bags. But uh, the stuff we saw on social media was them, um, photos of them having their nails done um, and the goodies they picked up at the show rather than what they'd learned, you know, on, and they were there in our time, company time. Uh, and that's why I kind of, it feels a bit controversial <laughs> saying it, because you want to 
share on social media the fun stuff you when you're out at PA events or learning and stuff but then you circle it back to that perception we're not in a strong enough position as a profession to keep going down this gimmicky mm. candy floss route if that makes sense and I don't know what you kind of think you because obviously the perception is really good at GCU but you're very aware of what's going on in the rest of the country and, and other sectors as well mm -hmm. Um, yeah, no, you're right. I mean, we I, it, it's not on my radar at all because of, of how we are treated here, yeah. which is just that we're, you know, we're an integral part and we, we have voices um, mm -hmm. and, and we're respected. However, I do, you know, I've been there before. I've been to fighting for a place at, 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 at Rosemary's Scottish PA um, event, you know, in a, in a previous organisation I worked for it tried desperately hard to get 99 pounds to attend a conference um but it was actually a, a kind of turning of a turning point for me mm. because not only the networking and yeah there was a little goodie bag with some molten brown hand wash and, and you know a, a key ring or something but you know, <laughs> for me it wasn't about that it was about yeah. the actual speakers learning about different organizations and bringing that back to 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 the organization I was in at that point but I'm not so I'm I'm not acutely aware of that because we're treated well here and in my opinion we're we're treated well here um and certainly when I go to some of Rosemary's events the the different sectors it's the, there will probably be one or two out there that maybe still champion that but I think we've I think we've probably turned a bit of a corner particularly in, in Scotland. Mm. I, mean, I know that our university sector, we have one of my team is vice chair of the education sector PA network. So, you know, it, they, they share practice and it's, it's a hugely professional event when it, when it comes around and they've, they've done virtual events during pandemic and things. So, yeah, I'm, I, I don't think I have any sort of tips on that, but I think if you're, it's like that sort of group think thing, isn't it? If you're with like-minded people and you can spread that amongst your own networks, then th that goes a long way to just trying to get rid of this fluffy, paint your nails and put your lipstick mm. on. Mm. And I think you may not have a tip, but I have an observation on what you shared with us this afternoon. Your team take themselves seriously. They mm -hmm. bring their A game every day. So as much as yes, you're now giving credit to your organization for treating you well and giving you a seat at the table. But once you have the seat, you are making the most of that seat. Yeah. So I think there's there's definitely credit on both sides. And I think from what we've discussed this afternoon, it comes through very clearly that your team is very serious about what they do. Your people aren't about the pink and fluffy and having their nails painted. So um, congratulations on that as a team, mm -hmm. because I think that also makes a huge difference. It doesn't matter that you're invited to have a seat at the table. If you get to the table and you have nothing to say and no value to add, mm. the next person doesn't get a seat. So, you know, I think that is a lesson that we can all take from this. Yeah, and I think, listen, who doesn't love a bit of molten brown and, you know, some stationery? I'm having my nails painted. Come on, <laughs> yeah. girls. Let's not but bash can, it, okay? Yeah. But I can understand where the employees oh. come from. I mean, and, and if you're playing into... a piece where PA salaries have been going down or they were historically they've risen a bit during the candidate market but that will bottom out very quickly mm. um but it, I just kind of think you know if we're trying to be a profession then we should sort of behave like other professions do and yeah. you know you look old, at finance, yeah. HR you, you know I've been I to can't see pilots edition. going to a trade show getting their nails painted Okay. I've had, um, we've had to even stand at the CIPD show that it's a comp it's completely <laughs> different um and there was goodies there but it it was more stuff that was going to help them in but their it's day appropriate day. it's appropriate yeah, and I, I just kind of think if that's I got what the boss was saying from that firm because that's all the PA shared from their day on social yeah. media and they were tagging in the company look we're here on behalf of I get what he was saying and I get what he was coming at um because it, it then to him it was just well it's a day out the office gimmicky yeah it's a little um, bit of fun it's not really substance yeah um and also you know we we always talk about we want to encourage more men into the profession mm. if you see this online 
Yeah. As a man, are you going to say, oh my goodness, this looks amazing. I'm going to definitely attend this <laughs> or this is the profession for me. Look at the pink nails, you know. Um, I think there's, there's the disconnect as well. If we want to be more inclusive, we have to be aware, especially, I mean, the, how we brand things, what we attend, what we our expectations are of when we attend events. You know, yes, a little bit of fun. I'm not bashing it, but I am saying a whole bunch of pilots will not be having their nails painted at their aviation events. So <laughs> pilots, if you're out there, prove me wrong. Pictures, you're, you're welcome to tag us in the pictures of your nails. <laughs> oh, what fun, what fun. Um, but is there any like, anything else you kind of want to finish with today, Judy? Any thoughts, feelings, hopes for the future? Yeah, well, just funny, you, men you mentioned the diversity there, Anel, but our new team member is male. So Wonderful. we are really looking forward to, to having a different, a, diff a, di a different diversity in, across the team. So, yeah, that I think that'll be really interesting. But he's got a, a, an amazing background as well. So, we, you know, we can all we can all learn from from him. But no, I mean, I just think for, to, to summarize, it, it's a profession I've got a lot out of throughout my throughout my my life i was fortunate to meet my lovely husband through work so you know i'll count, count my lucky stars there too so yeah it's just that pathway and it, the getting on and off the bus anal analogy as well if you don't fit with if your values don't fit with an organization or their values or or leadership has changed then yeah it's it's your stop get off and get, get on the new one life's yeah. life's too short yeah yeah definitely and that also comes back to valuing yourself and your own contribution mm -hmm. if you are in a space where you don't feel that what you are contributing is being valued or you are expected to contribute less because of your position then by all means you are not trapped please don't stay there oh my goodness start looking for the next exit ramp start preparing for that exit ramp Thank, well, Jeannie, thank you so much. This has been such a, like, a sensational interview. And I knew it would be. That's why I wanted Jeannie and to come on the series. But I think your story and the way you hold yourself as a professional, I think that is incredibly inspiring. Um, I think I know there's a lot of unhappy PAs at the moment, different, you know, for different reasons, just feeling a bit flat, burnt out. Some of the stuff we've talked about, I think this will this interview for anyone that's listening will be a huge mood boost and absolutely kind of jolt, jolt of energy i can't thank you enough for, for being with us today we really really appreciate it thank you so much for having me and you know if i can brighten up somebody's day with a little anecdote then it's been worth it and your gorgeous <laughs> Scottish accent, of I course. <laughs> and, and as ever, I won't do a Scottish accent and offend all of Scotland. <laughs> I've tried. I have tried in the past. Um, but thank you very much, um, Julie. And uh, you've been such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for joining this episode of the Assistant Lab. If you enjoyed this content, you know what you need to do. Feel free to share it and help us grow our subscriber base. Join us again next time. And until then, keep experimenting, innovating and improving your skill sets.